Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to day two of the ECB CEPR conference on the macroeconomic implications of CBDC. My name is uh, Tony Arnott from the ECB and CEPR, and I'm going to chair this third session on central bank digital currency and the banking sector. We have two fascinating uh, papers uh, in the program. Just to remind everybody, the split is uh, 25 minutes for the presenter, 10 minutes for the discussant, and then roughly 10 minutes for, for Q&A at the end. And I'm going to use uh, both signs and for the presenters also an, uh, an alarm to just remind them uh, of the time. So the, the first paper is uh, presented by uh, Maria Elena. Okay. 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 Good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the organizer for putting together such an amazing conference and for inviting me to present this paper on the interplay between central bank digital currency and bank deposits. Uh, I'm Maria Elena from Uppsala University and the Center for Monetary Policy and Financial Stability in Stockholm. And this is a joint work with Han Feng also at uh, Uppsala. Okay, so I don't think I have to spend too much time on the motivation um, for CBDC. So uh, the majority of uh, central banks has been uh, investigating uh, the issuance of uh, central bank digital currency. Um, there are several reasons. Uh, I just report two. So there is this growing demand for digital payments methods for retail purposes. So precisely for uh, the general public. Uh, and this is also in response to the uh, rising demand of, like, not, you know, the, the case for CBDC, it's also in response to uh, the rise of stable coins and uh, uh, other crypto assets such as bitcoins. Uh, and also the gradual decline of the use of cash for transactions in many economies. And I think Sweden here, it's a, a very good example. Um, so one of the major concerns for central banks when thinking of CBDC is the risk of households substituting away uh, bank deposit for CBDC. So this is because this could potentially lead to disintermediation of the banking sector in terms of reduced bank profits and uh, um, negative real effects on the general economy. So this would lead to financial instability, which of course it's a big concern. So in this paper, we try to answer two questions. So what is the potential risk of financial instability following the introduction of a CBDC, uh, in particular uh, in relation with the equivalence result in the literature? So uh, we uh, answer this question by building a um, real business cycle model with CBDC and bank deposit based on Dirk Nippelt work. Uh, and then we revisit the equivalence result in the literature. So uh, I'm not spending too much time telling you what's that, but it's simply the uh, fact that the private and the public um, payments are equally efficient um, in the way that the central bank can pass back fundings to commercial banks upon introducing CBDC. So uh, we revisit uh, this in two ways. First, we add a financial friction for central bank lending to banks, namely the collateral requirement. So this is done in the context of the discount window lending uh, facility uh, that it's extended from central banks to commercial banks behind some uh, collaterals. Uh, and also we consider different degree of substitutability between CBDC and deposits. Uh, so yeah, imperfect substitutability. Uh, so the next question is okay, but if there are real effects in the economy, uh, does this substitutability between the two assets uh, impact the risk of financial instability? So we will answer this uh, with a dynamic analysis um, of the shift in the household's preferences. So 
Likewise, I'm not spending too much time on the literature because uh, it's mainly done by people in this room. Um, but uh, basically, we're going to contribute in three ways. So uh, to the literature on the introduction of CBDC on commercial banks, which is even more, it's even bigger than the papers I mentioned here. Uh, then, yeah, the equivalence of payment system and then this relationship between CBDC and bank deposit, which, which maybe it's a bit less uh, studied for now. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of the results. Um, so we're going to study the equivalency in two scenarios. So the first scenario is the CBDC and bank deposit as perfect substitute with this collateral constraint for central bank lending. Uh, so we find that the central bank can replace the lost funding for banks uh, under more restrictive conditions than what those found in the literature, uh, precisely because of this collateral constraint. Uh, so there are no effect on financial stability. Uh, however, when the two assets are in perfect substitute, the central bank can post a loan rate, but this rate won't make the bank indifferent to the competition from CBDC because they, uh, their um, profit change uh, won't be uh, zero. So eventually there will be some real effect in the economy. So the equivalence um, analysis is done uh, through a comparison between two steady states, one without CBDC or with a very little amount of CBDC and one with CBDC. Uh, so then to answer, to inform more what has the real effect in the economy, um, we move to a dynamic setting uh, and we study uh, the uh, effect of shifts in the household's preferences. Um, so what we eventually find is that uh, the CBDC demand increase, but there is limiting, limited crowding out of deposits. Um, but bank profit drops due to lower bank market power. So it's a result that uh, confirms most of the literature on this topic. Uh, so eventually, uh, the substitutability between CBDC and deposit is key for uh, central banks when think of introducing CBDC. Okay, so uh, the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly through the model, um, then uh, the main part, so the revisitation of the equivalence result, then the dynamic analysis, and then I'm going to conclude. So, um, as I said, uh, we build the model on Deer's work. Uh, we have uh, a non-competitive bank that invests in capital, reserves, government bonds, and found through uh, deposits or borrowing from the central bank, subject to a collateral requirement in the context of the discount window lending. So uh, I chose to focus on the collateral requirement because this is the uh, addiction we make. Uh, so the collateral requirement is formulated following the standard literature, um, and it implies that the um, L, so the central bank loan extended to banks, must be lower than a fraction of the bonds held by the banks. Uh, so the fraction, the collateral parameter is theta B, uh, which of course is bounded between zero and one. Uh, B is the amount of government bonds held by the bank. Uh, which is remunerated at a rate lower than the risk-free rate because of the convenience yield. So uh, commercial banks have uh, some benefit from holding government bonds because they can precisely use them as collateral to get funding from uh, the central bank. And RL is the central bank loan rate, which is the object of interest in the equivalence result. Okay, so the rest of the economy, uh, it's composed by households that value good leisure and the liquidity pro uh, services provided by CBDC and deposits. And um, neoclassical firms that produce using labor and physical capital and a consolidated government that collect taxes, pays deposit subsidies, invest in capital, lends to banks against collateral and issues CBDC and reserves. Okay, so um, in the context of the equivalence result, 
um, we consider uh, an initial equilibrium with a policy uh, with deposit and reserves. So there exists another policy in equilibrium with less deposit and reserves, a CBDC, central bank loans, government bonds, different ownership structure of capital, additional taxes on the household, but otherwise the same uh, equilibrium allocation and prices. So as I mentioned, we start by uh, revisiting this result, considering the case of per perfect substitutability between CBDC and deposit with the collateral requirement for central bank lending. So um, the household's real balances, Z, are a function of both CBDC uh, M and deposit N, um, where here the weight lambda represents the liquidity benefit of holding CBDC relative to deposits. So we derive this central bank loan rate, RL, that uh, pass back loss funding for deposit to the banks. So this loan rate uh, depends on the rate of return on deposit, RN, uh, the risk-free rate, uh, the rate of return on reserves, RR, uh, the rate of return on capital, and uh, that of bonds. Um, and also on the operating cost of banks. Can I use the pointer? Well, whatever. So it's the new, which is a function of the reserve to deposit ratio. Um, of the banks, uh, so SETA, and of the other banks, SETA bar. So this is done to capture potential externalities from uh, other banks affecting the representative bank. Um, then here, theta T is the subsidy rate of the central bank to banks, uh, while theta B is the collateral parameter. So to zoom in on this result, uh, we call it the central bank equivalent loan rate in the context of the equivalent analysis. Uh, so this rate, um, it differs from the loan rate without the collateral requirement precisely for this term at the denominator. So this term, uh, it's positive uh, because from the household problem, the rate of return on capital is not risky, so it can be approximated with the risk-free rate. Um, and from the convenience yield, we know that the uh, rate of return on bond is lower than the risk-free rate. And of course, the collateral parameter is bounded between zero and one. So it follows that the central bank loan rate with a collateral friction, so the collateral requirement, is lower than without. So the intuition is that when there is uh, no collateral requirement for central bank lending, uh, the bank can borrow as much as you want from the central bank. However, when the, there is a collateral requirement it must respect, the central bank needs to post a lower loan rate to incentivize the bank to borrow as much as before. So this is done because um, in this way, there is no change uh, in bank's profit and in the, the bank's balance sheet. So there are no real effect of introduce, introducing CBDC. Uh, so in the paper, there is a graph uh, represent, reporting uh, the relationship between the loan rate and the uh, collateral requirement. Uh, it's, uh, I, I'm not reporting it here, but just to mention that the loan rate that the central bank offer is lower with tighter collateral constraint. So it depends precisely on the level of the collateral requirement set by the central bank. So then we move to the case with imperfect substitutability between CBDC and deposit with the collateral requirement. So in this case, uh, household real balances uh, are a CES uh, aggregator of CBDC and deposit. And here the new parameter epsilon, which is positive, uh, is the inverse of the elasticity of substitution between the two assets. So in this case, uh, we can derive a central bank uh, loan rate, but this does not imply that banks' profit are unchanged. So the, the central bank loan rate posted does not imply that. 
So the intuition is that when there is a change in banks' profitability, uh, the new policy does not guarantee the same equilibrium allocation as before. So uh, banks are not indifferent to the competition from CBDC, and there will be some real effect in the economy. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, the equivalence result is a comparison between two city states. So to inform how this, uh, how does an increase in CBDC demand affect the real economy and financial stability ultimately, uh, we move on with, to a um, dynamic analysis. So uh, CBDC and deposits uh, are imperfect substitute. This is an assumption that has been done uh, in the in the literature. Uh, there might be different reasons. Uh, I remember yesterday someone asked, okay, why this can be the case? Uh, it can be, for example, uh, I think Barder and Kumov mentioned this in their paper. Um, they use the, um, uh, they make the comparison with households switching their banks. So households uh, tend to, stand, to stay what we've, they know better. So uh, this can also be a, a motivation. Um, so then uh, we, we solved the model, we found the equilibrium, and then we shocked the economy uh, to study the responses to change in the household preferences for CBDC over deposits. Uh, so we uh, do, we study two shocks. So one is the positive shock to the liquidity benefit of CBDC, which is the parameter lambda t. Uh, and the other, it's a negative shock to the substitutability between CBDC and deposit, which is one over the uh, epsilon parameter in the CES aggregator. Um, so, I just, in the paper, I have more uh, impulse responses. Here I'm reporting the most interesting one. So um, the responses are reported as percentage point uh, deviations uh, from uh, uh, percentage point deviations. Uh, and uh, here we, we do the analysis assuming that the rate uh, of return on, C on CBDC, it's lower than that of deposit. Um, uh, and we keep that rate fixed in, this, in the dynamic analysis. So the, the two impulse responses, so the blue, uh, sorry, the black one uh, referred to the shock to the liquidity uh, weight of CBDC uh, and the blue one to the substitutability. So, uh, the two shocks means, uh, the, in the terms of lambda, it means that CBDC is becoming a more attractive uh, means of payment uh, because it, uh, it's a positive shock to the liquidity benefit attached to it, uh, while uh, the blue responses uh, means that it's, uh, the substitutability between the two assets is diminishing. So it's a negative shock to the substitutability. So you see that the two shock are quite similar in the responses. Uh, for example, if we focus on the lambda shock, so the black responses, um, you see that there is a drop in the spread of CBDC deposit and reserve. So the spread here is the surplus on the risk-free rate. So uh, since the rate uh, of CBDC and reserve uh, is kept fixed, this uh, drop is due to the drop in the risk-free rate, which is not reported here. So the drop in the deposit spread is interesting because you see it's, it's much larger than the other two. This is because the deposit spread depends both on the CBDC and the reserve spread. So the reserve spread represents the uh, marginal cost of issuing deposit because of this uh, of the cost function of banks depending on the reserve to deposit ratio. Um, while the deposit spread depends on the CBDC spread, because here banks have market power, um, so they can charge a markup on their prices. So yeah, the deposit spread drops by large compared to the other two spreads. And here you see the CBDC demand, the first graph top left, 
uh, increases. Um, this is pretty intuitive because the liquidity benefit of CBDC has increased. So then uh, the reason why banks profit drops is because uh, as uh, the demand for CBDC increases, banks face uh, a reduction in their market power. So in their uh, possibility to charge this uh, markup on the prices. So this will eventually lead to a uh, drop in banks' profits uh, to prevent the huge deposit outflow. So the main difference uh, between these two exercises we do, it's in the deposit uh, demand response. So in case of uh, negative shock to the substitutability between the uh, the two assets, so the blue line on the top right uh, graph. So you see there is a minor uh, decrease in the deposit demand. So uh, recall that here the rate of return on CBDC is lower than that of deposit. Um, so this scenario is analogous to one studied by Bacchetta and Perazzi. Uh, so they also assume this and they find the similar similar result. So here the intuition is that it takes more of one asset to replace the other uh, in this in this shock to the so negative shock to the substitutability between the two. So actually I think I'm a bit ahead <laughs> of schedule. Um, so yeah I just want to conclude to say um, yeah, basically, uh, with this study, we found that it's important to consider the degree of substitutability between CBDC and deposits when evaluating the consequences of issuing CBDC. Uh, of course, it's not easy, but uh, it's important to keep in mind and also accounting for the collateral requirement uh, banks must respect when borrowing from the central bank because this, the central bank loan rate depends on the constraint restrictiveness. So as I said, the tighter the collateral constraint, the lower the central bank loan rate must be. This is, of course, in the context of the equivalence analysis. Uh, however, uh, even when we find that CBDC has real effect on the economy and negative effect on banks' profit, this effect seems limited. So, um, yeah, that's basically what I have to say. So, thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. about some of the additional material on the extra slides, or you want to move over to the discussion? Uh, the same. I don't know if the audience is interested in the model. I put everything in the slides because it's a fairly standard RBC. Yeah. So well, then maybe we, whatever extra time we have, we keep it for the Q&A and makes it, makes it more lively. Okay. So let's move uh, on to a discussant. Uh, Dirk Niepert is going to discuss the paper. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thanks again uh, very much uh, to the ECB for, for making this possible. This is a very uh, ambitious paper here by Maria Elena and Han Feng about, I think, two questions, um, not directly related, maybe it could be even two different papers. One concerns the neutrality questions, under what conditions can we conceptually, in principle, think about the central bank completely sterilizing the effects of retail CBDC on the banking sector, on the real economy, on everything. And in particular, what they're asking is whether this is possible in a world in which if the central bank were to refinance banks, this is only possible subject to some collateral requirements. And the other aspect that they focus on is whether this would be possible, this neutrality, if there is some nonlinear liquidity aggregation somewhere in the economy, they particularly focus on some nonlinear um, liquidity preferences, some CES aggregate of liquidity preferences. That's one part of the paper. And the other paper is about is more standard in the sense that they simulate an economy subject to those frictions or subject to those properties and see you know how it responds to certain shocks. That is more, 
I think, aligned with some of the other papers that we have already seen and I think that we're going to see also today. Um, now, the paper that the, uh, the model that they are using to study those questions is based on some work of mine, and I feel a bit embarrassed, but in order to sort of pinpoint what exactly the contributions of the paper are, I would like to contra positive to what these other models or papers have suggested. So when it comes to the neutrality, they, they contrasted with this paper of Marcus's and mine. And what we found in that paper was that as soon as you have some nonlinear liquidity aggregation or more generally some nonlinear feature through which liquidity matters for the allocation, you cannot get neutrality. And the intuition is the following that uh, a sufficient condition, at least for neutrality, is that all the different agents in the model, they need to preserve their wealth position because if the wealth positions change, then the choice sets change and then everything will change to some extent. So you certainly need this to be the same in order to guarantee neutrality. On top of this, what you also need to guarantee is that all of the agents in the model maintain their liquidity positions defined as how much purchasing power are they actually giving up in order to hold liquidity. So these things you need to keep constant, otherwise you will not have neutrality. But if you need to keep those two things constant, and you also want to keep the price system in equilibrium constant, which you also need for neutrality, then you need to hold constant the liquidity positions of everybody and the relative prices of liquidity. So how much of a spread does it cost you to hold deposits? How much of a spread does it cost you to hold CBDC, for example? And if you want to have all these things being constant, which you need, if you want to guarantee neutrality, then you cannot have some aggregation that is nonlinear, because as soon as you start to shift um, how much liquidity you um, hold in the form of deposits, as opposed to, say, CBDC, then the marginal utility, so to speak, of these different positions will change, and therefore the relative spreads will change, and therefore you cannot have neutrality. So I think we know from this result that uh, nonlinear liquidity aggregation necessarily undermines neutrality. So in that sense, I think that is not a new result that, that um, Maria Elena and Hanfeng show us that this will matter somehow. The really new aspect that they bring to the table is that you could still have neutrality according to their result if you impose a collateral requirement. That's sort of the new aspect, I think, if you look at it from this side. Then the other paper, and that's basically where they built the model on, is, is my paper from 22 and whatever it took until it was published finally. Um, so there um, is no collateral requirement indeed. So this is completely new, what they introduce here. In the first, in one of the first versions, I had linear liquidity aggregation, and then I focused on utility, positive aspects, normative stuff. All of this is gone now because the referees didn't like it. The final version in the JFE, in the JF, still has no collateral requirement, but it has both linear and nonlinear aggregation, and it just focuses on the normative aspects. So against this perspective, again, the contribution of the paper to me, the most interesting question is, could we still have neutrality even with such a collateral requirement? And then the positive analysis um, that is also completely different from what I did in those papers. So let me focus on these two contributions and see um, um, what to make of those. The first one on the positive side, um, as I already told you, I'm, I'm perfectly on board with arguing and expecting and believing that if you have CES liquidity aggregation, this will matter. No, no doubt about this. I think this is clear, very convincing. Um, in the positive analysis as they conduct it, they do not, to my understanding, really model a central bank loan and collateral in the form of government bonds. And the reason, of course, is that beforehand in the neutrality result, they argued it doesn't matter. So it makes sense not to put this in the positive analysis. So I'm sort of fine with what they're doing on the positive side. I, I believe that. Um, when it comes to the neutrality result, there I'm a bit less on board. I agree with the derivation that Maria Elena showed you about what such an equivalent loan rate would have to be, such that if the central bank is willing to refinance banks at that particular rate, um, the banks would be able to maintain their profits um, from beforehand the introduction of, of CBDC. I think what they lose sight a little bit of is the following feature. Um, 
the, the, the bigger picture of this equivalence result was, you know, what does it take for the central bank to intervene such that the banks maintain their choice sets in total, which means in particular that you continue to rely on the banks to extend credit to the real economy, or in the language of that model, that on the asset side of the banks, their capital holdings, their, their holdings of physical capital are exactly the same as the one in the world before CBDC when they were financed through deposits. Because what you want is that the banks can basically maintain their business model as it was, except that on their financing side, the depositors are replaced by the central bank loan. That's the purpose. You would like to change the payment system. Therefore, you have to change the liability side of the bank's balance sheet, but you don't want to interfere in any way with what the banks are doing on the asset side of their, of their balance sheet. If you can maintain this and you also get the incentives for the banks right, then you have insulated the banks from the introduction of retail CBDC because then they can continue doing their business exactly in the same way as they used to. It's just that the financing has changed. Now the question, is this possible? And the answer is no, because what they are doing is that they are saying, okay, um, let me, the central bank, refinance the banks, but only under the condition that the banks only hold such and such amounts of government bonds, which then will be the collateral for me, the central bank, to extend this loan to the banking sector. But if the banks hold all these government bonds, then they will not be able to hold capital anymore. So they will not be the ones to extend credit to the real economy anymore. In the equilibrium that they show us, I think it is the central bank now that has taken on all these capital holdings from the banking sector. So now we have truly this, what some people fear, the neutrality result would suggest this big socialist central bank out there, right? That is in the business of credit extension to the, to the real sector. So in that sense, I don't think that it's really a neutrality result. It's a result that says, you know, the, the central bank could take over extension of credit to Main Street and still maintain the profits of the banking sector. That's true, but it would not maintain the business model of banks in the sense that they are in charge of extending credit to Main Street. Now you could say, okay, then let's rewrite the model a little bit and let's assume that rather than having uh, than holding bonds, uh, the bank could sort of provide the capital exposure to the real economy as a collateral to the central bank. And, and there's potentially some, some way to go here. Uh, but then again, this would not be truly a neutrality result because in the initial allocation, this capital did not serve as a collateral to depositors. If it has to serve as a collateral later on to the central bank, uh, then this makes a difference unless in the first economy collateral wasn't scarce at all or there was no role for collateral or whatever. So, so I don't think it's truly a neutrality result that they're showing here. I think what they established is that you can insulate bank profits but you cannot insulate banks' business model from retail CBDC. Let me conclude with um, um, what I think is, uh, so my perspective more generally on this collateral thing. I think, so when I argue that to a first approximation, the central bank could insulate commercial banks from retail CBDC, and I get the response, this doesn't work because of collateral, I buy this. I think collateral undermines the neutrality result. Now, is this bad for the neutrality result or is it bad for the real world or whatever? I don't know. My perspective somewhat is that in the current world, we have a, we have a monetary architecture in which depositors provide funding to Deutsche Bank, anticipating whether correctly or not that in the worst possible scenario, the ECB would be backing Deutsche Bank. So right now, we believe as depositors somehow that the central bank is actually standing ready as a land of last resort to you know, safeguard depositors. So the current system works without collateral. Um, depositors do not ask for collateral from Deutsche Bank when they're providing funds to Deutsche Bank. In this world with CBDC, we would just make this explicit. It would be exactly the same arrangement, except for the land of last resort arrangement would become an explicit arrangement in the sense that this refinancing through the central bank actually happens. Now, it is correct that if in this new world, which just makes explicit what is implicit today, if in this new world we ask suddenly for collateral, then there is no neutrality. That's true. 
The question to me, therefore, that comes out from this non-neutrality is rather why don't we ask for collateral today in the current system? Why do depositors today don't ask for collateral when they provide funding, cheap funding to commercial banks, although in essence, it is the central bank that makes sure that we are doing this. At least we believe that it's the central bank that safeguards us when we are doing this and give uh, cheap funding to Deutsche Bank. So that's sort of my general perspective on this. Um, I think it's a, it's a nice paper. I'm not fully on board in this particular aspect. Thank you. Excellent presentation, great discussion. So let's collect uh, a few uh, questions, both uh, from uh, the audience here in the room and if there are any uh, questions online as well. And then I uh, give the floor back to uh, Maria Elena to respond to both discussions and questions. Yes, can we, is there anybody with a mic to circulate? So let's start with the first round of three questions. One, two, three. Thank you. So two things. I, I start with the with the model. So <clears throat> I think they're on top of the issue that Dirk was saying. So is is about where is going the risk in the asset side of banks is moving from banks to the central bank. So you have a, a redistribution of risk. So and, and the central bank would be not the lender of last resort, but the lender of first resort. I think there is another issue. So this is a RBC, so you don't have nominal rigidities. And you have this lending rate that is offsetting in some sense uh, the, the profitability of banks. But imagine to have some nominal rigidities and the lending rate then is also an instrument for monetary policy. And you would be in a classical, not Tim Bank, Tim Berger rule where you have the same instrument that is used for two different uh, objectives, price stability and let's say keep profitability of banks. So this is another reason why I don't believe that it would hold in this case, this uh, neutrality of the um, of this policy. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually have a question. So um, we have the CBDC um, preference shock. And this leads then, I think, if I if I saw correctly on the picture to and also to an increase in, in deposits. So maybe you can also explain a bit more on this channel. I had a similar question, more for me to understanding how the model works, and uh, say the impulse response that you showed it had the, it had two shocks. Uh, one of the two was a preference shock that was common to the CBDC and to the deposits, the epsilon, if I'm not wrong, no. But the CBDC goes up and deposit goes down, and I would exp uh, my intuition would have been the the opposite, no. That if the preference shock is common, they should uh, behave kind of similarly. Um, if you can, uh, maybe I, I missed some point probably in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So there was a lot of emphasis on the neutrality uh, point. My question is, uh, is neutrality a desirable aim? I mean, from a practical perspective, CBDCs will be introduced a number of reasons that we have discussed several times. You're introducing a new liability of the central bank. As a result, commercial banks will have to adapt. As such, they will have to adapt their business model. And this doesn't seem to me a very bad thing. I mean, short of creating financial instability episodes, which nobody wants, you would just force uh, commercial banks to adapt to a new system and they could find new ways of making money and become more profitable once CBDCs are introduced and potentially new digital assets can be issued by the commercial banks themselves. Thank you. Okay. Please. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dirk, for the great discussion. Um, yeah. Uh, I agree with all the points. Uh, I think the point on the the comment on the neutrality 
result which doesn't hold eventually it's really interesting uh we, we can talk more about it later um so regarding nominal rigidity uh thank you that's also a very interesting comment uh about the loan being an instrument for monetary policy so that also implies that maybe that this neutrality result does not hold so it will also look into that um so uh in terms of the two questions on the uh dynamic uh in the in the model uh so the first question was why uh, there is uh, an increase in the deposit demand following the shock so um this is the case for a shock to the liquidity benefit of cbdc so it's a positive shock which uh, leads to an expansion in the liquidity in the system so since they are imperfect substitutes in this case uh, this will lend to the expansion of the demand for both assets uh with respect to the shock to the substitutability parameter, so the second shock, the one on epsilon, the blue one, um, so you were puzzled because they behave uh, differently, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, you mean in terms of the demand, right? Yes. uh yeah which is the case for the epsilon uh, sorry for the lambda shock but not for the epsilon because of the initial uh, uh, steady state values of the two rates so the rate of return on cbdc is lower than that of deposit which is something that can be um, plausible uh, so then uh, as i said it takes more of one asset to replace the other so that's why we have this uh, minor decrease in the deposit demand uh, and in terms of neutrality, I think I really need to think more about it. Uh, so yeah, I, I have a lot of thinking to do on that. Say something. Yes, please. On the neutrality, uh, why is it that I get so fascinated about this? I think there's two important insights from neutrality results. The first one is that we want to understand why CBDC matters in the first place. It's not obvious. And in particular, when we write down more complicated models with all kinds of bells and whistles and we see curves going up and down, we want to understand, is this because of CBDC or is this because of some other, uh, some other talk assumptions in those models? And often it's the latter. So I think we need to understand exactly which condition of the neutrality result is violated so that we are sure that this is really CBDC proper and not something else which drives the results. The second feature is that the immediate response or the immediate thinking, I think, among many central bankers in like five years ago was this is obviously crazy because it will change everything and the world will go under. And I think the neutrality results uh, with increasing sophistication show us it is not that obvious that the world will change dramatically as a consequence of CBDC. The world might change dramatically as a consequence of particular central bank choices in response to CBDC. Central banks have a lot of leeway to neutralizing these things if they wanted to. Of course, they may not want to, and I fully agree with you that we shouldn't aim at this. This is not some normative objective to have neutrality, but it's a lower bound. If we know that in principle we could ensure uh, neutrality, then we know with a very high likelihood we can actually do better than the status quo, which should make us think about this option. Let me abuse my role as chair to make a comment on, on this uh, literature given a fairly imperfect understanding. So I find it very useful as a theoretical benchmark to exactly see, uh, you know, when it's violated. It's a bit like maybe Modigliani Miller on capital structure. Nobody believes that Modigliani Miller holds in the real world, but it really forces us to think, you know, what, of, what are the assumptions are exactly violated such that the capital structure of, uh, of a firm or a bank uh, matters and that's why i find it you know it's a it's a useful theoretical exercise but but hopefully central bankers around the world will actually not strive for neutrality but for an improvement in the allocation and you know increasing welfare by designing it in a way that it might for example in many papers we had uh, reducing imperfect competition in deposit markets or whatever the frictions are right yeah so it's a very valuable benchmark like other benchmarks 
Okay. Any any more questions? Comments? If not, uh, let's move on to the next paper: uh, Central Bank Digital Currency and uh, Banking Choices, presented by uh, Andrew Usher from the Bank of Canada. So, which really seems to be a Bank of Canada effort of current or former um, bank employees. Twenty-five minutes. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for uh, for bringing us here. Uh, it's nice to reconnect after after a lot of years. I uh, I think I was Tony's RA for a short period when I was at the bank as a research assistant. Uh, so someone asked me yesterday, what did I learn from uh, the talks yesterday? And I said I learned it was a macroeconomic conference. So I'm a I'm a structural I/O guy. So there's a bit of a bit of a story to why I'm presenting something that uses the methods of of I/O to macro people. I think it's great. So we're 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 trying to take on these big questions about the future of money and the future of of the banking system. Uh, I think pretty quickly we start talking about imperfect substitutability, about market power about the choices of banks. I think these are worlds where IO economists and in, more in general, micro economists and micro data people have quite a bit to say. So hopefully I inspire you to think about some of these things in a way that's not just macro. And hopefully some of my answers will roll up and become part of Dirk or other people's papers, thinking about how, uh, how substitutability might look. Uh, so standard disclaimer doesn't reflect the Bank of Canada or Governing Council. Everyone here understands that sort of uh, thing. Uh, so CBDC, digital money, we're really focused on retail payment CBDC. Uh, despite this widespread interest, there's a lot of people who are worried about crowding out, we're gonna call it. We're not gonna say disintermediation because we're really focused today on the deposit market. We're not gonna have a lot to say about loans. Okay, so we're going to develop and estimate a structural model that's going to be familiar to IO economists, maybe less familiar to uh, to uh, macroeconomists. I'll take you through some of the particulars. Uh, one of the major things we want to highlight is that there's attributes that are going to drive adoption and the response other than the interest rate. So a lot of people are focused on remuneration. I think it's a key attribute. There's other ones that matter, and there's other ones that the, C that the central bank might control, particularly because a lot of people don't want to pay interest. A lot of central banks are saying, we're not paying interest. It's a different product. Well, there's a lot of places that we should think about uh, roles for the central bank or choices. Uh, firstly is the service location. How are people actually going to get access to CBDC? They're gonna to have to be onboarded. They're gonna to have to get service. This is a very practical question. And we're gonna compare schemes where it's done entirely online to done by the post office to done in actually in bank branches. So imagining some sort of intermediated mo model that is probably on the mind of a lot of central bankers is we're gonna get the, the bank branches to actually do the hard part and we're gonna offer the back end. We're gonna think about what impact that would have on the demand. Uh, additionally, we're going to think about the fact that banks don't just sell deposits. So consumers, when they're choosing their deposit bank, care about the other products they might get at that bank. A lot of people, it turns out, get their mortgage, their credit card, and their deposit at the same place. And that's going to have a fairly big impact on the choice. It's also something that the central bank probably isn't going to do. Practically, we're not going to offer mortgages to consumers. I don't think that's surprising. Okay. Uh, methodologically, so we're really focused on the consumer. We're going to build a demand side that uh, you're going to choose your, your main bank branch based on the network, based on the possibility of getting another product from that bank. Uh, on the supply side, we're going to have a fairly standard for I.O. Uh, Banks are going to compete in differentiated, basically Nash Bertrand. It's going to be static, uh, and they're going to compete in the deposit rate. So in spirit, I think kind of similar to some of the other models we've seen that banks are basically setting a deposit rate and determining how much deposits they're going to get from a demand curve. 
Uh, probably a little bit different than the approaches we've seen here in the last couple of days. We're going to estimate the model using household and branch level data. So we've got information on which bank, which bank the household chose, uh, how much liquid assets. We've got information on their portfolio of banking uh, uh, banking choices. Uh, we're going to learn something about demand parameters. Basically, going to build a whole demand system. Uh, preferences for rate of return, bank branches, preferences for other products. Uh, and then with this demand curve and a notion of equilibrium, we'll be able to basically back out what we need for a counterfactual, which is some notion of a marginal cost. So if we have a demand curve, a supply curve, and a marginal cost, we can play with the central bank digital currency uh, in the counterfactual. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that central bank digital currency doesn't exist. But there are papers in I.O., particularly thinking about a minivan. You can think about the demand for a minivan if you think about the demand for a sedan and a van. Well, it must be somewhere in between. Some of those, some of those attributes you can der derive the demand for. But there's always going to be some amount that we can't learn until we actually issue. Uh, and in our paper, the CBDC attributes are exogenous. And we're going to vary them and think about how, uh, how the response of the banking system, but also the households particularly, are going to look. Uh, a lot of literature, some people in this room, probably missing some people in this room's papers. I want to focus, however, on the empirical work that's been done. So Jachi's previous paper, which I think is in the JME now, uh, it's going to think about just the household demand for CBDC relative to deposits in cash. She's going to be using a similar or the same survey as us, uh, but she's really only focused on the household and trying to think about sort of the bounds and what goes into household choice of liquid assets. Uh, Tony Whitehead and a bunch of co-authors, uh, they're going to be quantifying the effect on lending in particular. They're going to have a structural model that focuses on some of the things that uh, your, your macro models have focused on, collateral, uh, the dynamics of deposits, the, the, the dynamics of loan uh, resetting. Uh, complicated model, we're focusing much, much more on the consumer. We're putting the consumer in the driving seat, what, saying what does the consumer want, how are they going to adapt this product. Uh, there's a separate theory or a separate set of literature. Uh, Kim P. Hoon, uh, one of his papers, with some co-authors at the bank, Alex and someone else, I can't remember their name at the moment. Uh, they're gonna predict the adoption and usage of CBDC, but really at the point of sale. So in a choice set with, do I pay with my credit card or do I pay with cash? Complementary idea to ours, we're focused on how do I allocate my bank? So their, their intercept is sort of our model and our intercept is sort of their model. Uh, we're gonna be on, uh, adding this idea that this branch network, sort of a practical idea of how do people actually get CBDC, what drives their demand uh, to in-person services, as well as this idea of complementarities. Quick outline, I'll take you through the model. Uh, so we have three stages. Uh, we're gonna basically use backwards induction on the household to figure out what their eventual demand for uh, deposit bank is gonna be, what their utility from choosing any given uh, deposit bank. Uh, at the bottom, uh, there's some set of products K, think credit card or mortgage or sort of investment uh, product. Uh, but they're gonna face a choice set uh, that's gonna depend on whether they've chosen that as their home bank. So they're gonna get some amount of extra utility if I pick Deutsche Bank for my deposits and Deutsche Bank for my mortgage. If I pick another German bank, I'm gonna get slightly less utility. The idea is gonna be that I can figure out what my expected utility from getting a mortgage is if I choose Deutsche Bank, given where I live and how close the Deutsche Bank and everyone else's branches are. So we're gonna roll up this choice problem into basically an expected uh, value. In IO, we call that an inclusive value. It's including all the utilities of a choice that I'm gonna make in the future. Uh, additionally, we're gonna allow the household to basically allocate its liquid resources that are gonna be fixed in our model between 
uh, cash, so physical cash is going to remain, and whatever digital product they've uh, they've chosen to get, either CBDC or deposits. So we're going to allow the household to make this sort of continuous choice in a probably in a uh, in a constant elasticity framework. So it's something something a little bit similar to what we've seen uh, in the previous paper. Uh, again, that's going to give you the indirect utility. You're going to take a maximum. You're going to choose some interior amount of cash and deposits, and that's going to give you a indirect utility. Uh, essentially, then those indirect utilities are going to enter into basically a first stage utility function where I care about the branch network and also what I'm going to do later. They're gonna, I'm going to care about the possibility of getting these complementarities, but also care about the fact that I'm going to make this uh, liquid asset allocation. And there's going to be basically uh, uh, parameters that weight those, those, those relative importance, those relative uh, indirect utilities. Okay. Uh, essentially, that allows us to integrate over households and get an aggregate demand curve. So given all the, given all the parameters that we've estimated, we get an aggregate demand curve, uh, suppressing all the, uh, the household level or all the, uh, the other uh, inputs to the function. It depends on bank J's deposit rate, but also every other bank's deposit rate. Uh, we're writing down a very simple profit function, uh, which is just there's some exogenous loan rate minus some deposit rate minus some marginal cost of doing both processes. So I got to take the deposit, which might cost me something, but then I also have to make the loan. This is sort of partial equilibrium uh, way, way of thinking about the, the profit function of the, of the bank, because we're holding the loans uh, sort of exogenous. Uh, take a first order condition, you get this uh, markup that is going to be equal to the inverse semi-elasticity. Uh, this allows us to basically Take data, data, and data, and invert and find marginal cost, which is sort of a trick that I.O. people have used for a while, but allows us to do these counterfactuals. So introducing central bank digital currency, it's going to essentially be a new product at the top level choice. So you're going to be saying, should I allocate it to Deutsche Bank or to CBDC or to another German bank? Uh, Introducing CBDC is going to have a direct effect. Some people are going to like it. We have this uh, this error of unobservable that says, uh, you know, any product of greater than minus infinity utility is going to have some choice probability. Uh, so it's going to directly be a competitor. Uh, but there's going to be these these choices or these attributes that the central bank has chosen uh, that are going to impact this probability. Uh, the interest rate is going to enter directly into the uh, liquid asset allocation. Uh, the complementarity is basically going to be turned off for CBDC. So that whole term is going to be zero for CBDC. For banks, people are actually going to like that quite a bit. CBDC is not going to offer it. And then we're also going to be uh, differing the service location. So how, how, how uh, attractive CBDC is based on how much... Uh, uh, service locations and how, how near they are to the consumers. Uh, take you very quickly through the data. Uh, we're using something called the Canadian Financial Monitor. It's a wonderful survey because it has this micro data on not only where you live, but which bank you chose. Some other surveys will tell you where you live and how much deposits you have, but we know what bank you have. And that's really important for, for how we set this paper up. Uh, also got location, uh, information on deposits, mortgages, credit cards, GICs. I know the American term is basically a uh, CD, Certificate of a Deposit. So it's an insured but term sort of instrument that households uh, uh, buy. I think it's just a term deposit in, in Europe. It's just a term deposit yeah. in Europe, yeah. But I guess, I guess Canadians don't go to their bank and say I'd like a term deposit. They get a GIC. So it's just a just terminology. Uh, and then we have the location and then we got a bunch of rich, you know, how many members are there in the household, the racial characteristics, the locational characteristics, even language characteristics we have. Uh, we're going to be merging this with some data sets on where the banks are, where the post offices are, 
and that's going to be our our variation or our our uh, our choice set for where to where is it going to be uh, distributed by. Uh, we're using interest rates from uh, a firm called Canex. We're using the demand deposit rates, so we're really looking for this sort of basic transactional deposit, and we're basically assuming that that's the only thing that's a substitute to CBDC. So other papers, particularly the ones that focus on interest rates, are going to talk about term deposits and CBDC. We say if it's not really paying interest, we really only want it to be the, uh, the transactional deposits that are a close substitute. Uh, Five-year closed mortgage for our loan rate, that's the most common product in Canada. Uh, closed just means you pay a fee to uh, refinance if you do it before the five years. And I think when I talk to American audiences, they're shocked that not everyone in the world gets the wonderful 30 year mortgage, but we're stuck with five year, five year to 30, five year term, but 30 year amorts in Canada is the, is the normal. Uh, so for demand estimation, uh, give you a little bit of details on how we actually do it. Uh, we've set it up so that it's sort of done in stages. This is for attractability issues, and you can buy the results of one stage if you don't necessarily buy the results of another stage. That's uh, in contrast to how some other I.O. people will set up these problems. Uh, for the bank choices, uh, we basically uh, run a discrete choice model, pretty standard discrete choice model, and we find a very strong preference for the home bank. So if I've chosen it as my deposit bank, I'm probably going to get my mortgage from there. Uh, portfolio allocation, uh, we write down a optimization problem. We take the first order condition. I think we take logs, we do some transformations. It turns out that it's a linear problem in uh, an unobservable. So we can just run OLS. Uh, and there we find, which we're Pleased about higher deposit rate means you hold more deposits relative to cash. That's that's pretty good for our uh, our our uh, validation. Uh, deposit bank choice. So we take these two as given, roll them up into uh, another linear discrete choice model. Uh, we find that both of these terms matter quite a bit, which is positive that our our theory has some predictive power. Not only do, do people care about their uh, home bank uh, when they're making the mortgage choice, they seem to internalize that, at least in the context of our model, when they're, when they're making their uh, deposit choice. Uh, strong preferences for better branch network. Basically, that means you like having more branches near you and you like to be close to the branch. So we're including how many Deutsche banks there are in your market, which is about two kilometers for urban customers and about five kilometers for rural customers. And also, where's the nearest branch? So just a, just a great circle distance, how far are you from the, the nearest branch? And both of those matter a lot. Uh, supply estimation. Uh, so we basically take this first order condition and do an inversion, uh, take you through some of the averages very quickly. Mortgage rate taken as exogenous is pretty high. Deposit rate is very low. Uh, markup, which is the this inverse semi-elasticity, 2%. The banks appear to have some market power. Uh, and our marginal cost is about 2.7%, uh, which we take as exogenous as well uh, in all our counterfactuals. Uh, the return on assets for the largest banks in Canada in this period is about one9 so we're not that far off in terms of the markup. And you might imagine that they're all integrated broker deal with their broker dealers. So this is probably the least, the, low, the, the, the least profitable part of their business. But we're at least in the, in the ballpark of a, of a potential uh, profitability. Oh, okay. In counterfactuals, uh, we're going to hold these demand and cost primitives the same, solve a Nash Bertrand game basically in the uh, deposit rates. Uh, CBDC rate, we're going to basically vary between zero and the average interest rate, which is only 10 basis points. I think if we went to the overnight rate, which is now above 5%, we'd have pretty different results, but we don't think that's the relevant policy uh, experiment at the moment. Uh, 
we're going to allow the CBDC branch network to either be no network, basically an only online onboarding, uh, Canada Post. Again, we don't know what the relationship would look like. We're just saying we're somewhere where there's a federal office in a lot of small towns, the post office. And then we're also thinking about the union of all bank branches as sort of what is the extremum of the uh, of the best possible branch that could be available. Uh, and then obviously switching off the complementarities. Uh, the headline result on uh, adoption. So this is the share of CBDC in liquid assets. Uh, if there's no service location, not very many people like it. They like the post office a bit better. Uh, they like the bank branches even more, and they like the superset of those even better. Uh, and within each, it appears moving a pretty small amount of interest in most of our models of 10 basis points doesn't have that large an effect, which I don't think is that surprising. Okay, average reduction in deposits, so average across banks. So a slightly different way of aggregating that previous result, uh, we see a very similar picture that uh, without a service locations, very few people are gonna withdraw their deposits. Uh, and if we make the service locations very attractive, there's gonna be much more. And this is about the range of one of the largest banks. Sorry, this is about the range of one of the largest banks in Canada. Uh, Additionally, we're able to look at sort of the increase in the uh, interest rates across banks. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on this. Basically, banks with the largest local market shares are also those that have the highest markups, and they're going to be able to respond more. So they're going to lose fruit of deposits. So the guys that have really tight markups aren't going to respond a lot, and they're going to lose relatively more of their market share. So we're able to think about the heterogeneity across banks. I'm not going to focus too much on that. What I want to focus on, because I'm at the ECB, and I want to I want to say a little bit about this, is the holdings. So I think uh, Fabio Panetta yesterday was talking about how important it is to calibrate uh, some of these CBDC holdings. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be able to say a little bit about that in our model, which is exciting. Uh, in con so the Bank of England we were discussing has a much higher possible limits that they've at least discussed in speeches and and uh, policy discussions. And by that far off, will be discussed and 20,000 pounds. Uh, the ECB is much, much more conservative. And I think we're going to argue that's a little too conservative. Uh, essentially, in our model, if you choose CBDC, you're going to allocate liquid assets between CBDC and cash. And if you're constrained, you got to hold the remainder in cash. That's actually going to make CBDC pretty unattractive for someone who wants to hold a lot of liquid assets. So you're going to find the, the, the adoption and the utility is quite a bit lower. Okay. So here, uh, not allowed to walk too far. Uh, here we're going to vary between uh, different holding limits in Canadian dollars. Obviously, $100 is a ridiculously low limit, but that's just to fix the uh, ideas that, yeah, adoption would be pretty darn close to zero. If there was no limit, we'd have the results I showed you before, that about 13% of households under the most extreme network would uh, adopt or would hold their, their liquid assets in CBDC. Uh, What's really important and really interesting though, I think for, for policymakers, is if you were to set the limit to quite a high value, to $25,000, so after accounting for exchange rates, more like the Bank of England world than the ECB world, you can reduce the reduction in, in deposits by more than half. This seems a little counterintuitive if you think that everyone's the same. The, the issue with these deposits, though, is that it's an extremely right tail distribution. So there are some households that hold a couple thousand dollars and allocate them to another uh, liquid asset or they invest in stocks. And then there's some whales who have hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in deposits. And it turns out that's who the banks care about. And that's what matters for the aggregate share. So it's extremely right tail distribution. Uh, only 13% of households would be constrained by the limit of 25,000. And those households make up the, the most of the demand deposits. 
So I think the 90th percentile is something like uh, $31,000. And that's 52% of all the liquid assets held by those households. So I think there's, a, there's quite a bit to learn here. Uh, I also want to encourage that if we're going to think about calibrating these limits, you got to look at the micro data, not just averages. So I think I discussed with this ECB, uh, someone from the ECB previously that they thought about averages across households. I think when we're thinking about this, you really got to look at the whole distribution of, 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 uh, of liquid asset holdings. Uh, so actually, my, my, my boss, Francisco, had, had said, this can't be right. There can't be people who hold hundreds of thousands of dollars in deposits. Their opportunity cost is massive. He's not wrong. We don't have an answer for why they're doing this, but they're doing it. And I've confirmed this in another Canadian survey. So I recommend looking at as, as many surveys and seeing. I think this fact is probably true in, in, in most household surveys. Uh, to conclude, because I think Tony is about to give me one minute. Uh, we can also look at the changing consumer surplus, uh, basically across different designs. It's hard to think about what the changing consumer surplus for just introducing a CBDC is, but uh, we see uh, households on average aren't hurt that much by a uh, pretty big change in the, uh, or by a, a very large deposit limit. They go from 25 basis points to about 20 basis points average additional happiness, something like a compensating variation. Uh, in conclusion, we've built this model. Uh, someone from another policy institution asked me what a policy institution should take away from this. I'm going to basically summarize this as don't worry too much about this intermediation. I think, as Dirk said, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of levers to press on. One of them is you basically control how attractive it is to the consumer. And then you can use this limit. You can even set the very limit very high and you probably shouldn't worry too much about disintermediation from deposits because the, the biggest depositors aren't gonna leave. Uh, just an aside, a final aside is, I think it'd be really interesting, I think in Tony's paper to think about the uh, flow limits. It's very hard to find data to appropriately calibrate or appropriately find those those uh, those flow limits. But it's something that's also in this discussion, not just the holding limit. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll pass it over to Nicola. The discussion is uh, Nicola Pavanini. So let me start thanking the organizers for including me in the program and asking me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, I'll just wait for the slides to come. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be brief in summarizing the paper because I think uh, Andrew did a great job and, and, and I'll spend most of the time on my comments. So just a few quick highlights on, on my take on the paper. So there's a couple of research questions that the authors are after here. It's trying using a model to understand how CBDC would affect demand and supply of bank deposits. And in particular, they focus on two features of bank deposits that make this product differentiated, which are the ability of banks to provide financial products and the fact that they rely on a branch network which consumers might like. So how, how, to what extent these two, these two characteristics influence the effect of CBDC on demand and supply? So they build a model that like Andrew showed you on deposit demand and supply, where the supply is basically banks setting interest rates and competing Petra and Nash. And households can choose cash versus deposit holdings and then conditional on deposit, they choose which bank they wanna deposit their money in and they value branch network and the fact that they get complementary financial products. And then they use the model to run counterfactuals in which they introduce a CBDC and they do it under alternative scenarios with no or some interest bearing, some remuneration, and with alternative degrees of service location that CBDC wouldn't charge. 
they use this data as 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 Andrew described from from Canada, in which they have information on on households' uh, um, deposit and bank accounts uh, um, and the loans that they get from from survey evidence. They know the allocation of liquid assets, cash versus deposits, and they know the location of these depositors, which allows them to match this to the location of branch networks and and define a choice that the households have based on some travel distance time limit um, that defines how far they're willing to go to deposit their money. And then they have information on bank level interest rates on deposits and mortgage loans. And the key takeaways is that um, the take up of CBDC uh, heavily depends on the service location that will be assigned to it. So the, without any service location, fully digital, just like Andrew showed us, the take up would be 0.7% uh, market share of deposits and it can go up to almost 12% with the maximum amount of, of service location. And complementarity with financial services matters a lot, right? So in a world without it, to kind of reinterpret the results that Andrew showed you, CBDC could actually reach 38% market share. So this means that this plays a significant role. And then he, they look also at holding limits and, and they show how, uh, for, for example, 25,000 Canadian dollars holding limit will reduce the share by half across different scenarios in terms of service location. So this is just a couple of figures from the paper that Andrew already showed you on the left hand side. You see the share of CBDC across four different um, uh, degrees of service location, uh, and so it can go up to 12% at most. And on the right hand side, you see how banks would respond in terms of uh, um, deposit interest rates to kind of countervail the, the loss of, of market shares. And, and the numbers here are pretty small, right? So in, in the best scenario, the largest service location, banks would increase uh, deposit rate by uh, 3.5 basis points. So that's a, that's a pretty small number. Last thing I want to show you is the effect on consumer surplus. This is something Andrew didn't show you. And again, you know, the four set of, of columns here represent uh, the different degrees of service location, vertical axis is the change in consumer surplus. And the breakdown of these bars tells you to what extent the gain in consumer surplus come from three different potential sources. In gray, higher deposit rates, in, in uh, purple, better service network, and in, and in uh, uh, dark gray, more choice variety. So the vast majority of this comes from a better service location through the CBDC, right? So I have four sets of comments here and, and suggestions. The first is on this role of the complementary financial products, which is, is a, a key part of the paper. The second is on, on uh, the fact that this model basically allows for a single bank choice for deposit, not, not multi-homing. Uh, then I have something on identification and then kind of big picture questions on where the model could be taken to. And this kind of addresses some of the questions that other papers have addressed in this conference, but doing it through the eyes of an IO model, I think you could still look at stability, competition, and transmission of monetary policy. And, and I have a few suggestions on this. So let me start from the first. So the complementarity of financial products, they, they're important, right? But, but it, they're kind of exogenously given within the model. And of course, you could think that Banks might respond adjusting loan rates as well to the introduction of CBDC and 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 Andrew and co-authors have data on loan rates. So that's something that that could be used to, you know, could be endogenized within the model. And I think it's relevant because if you look at the literature, borrowers are, are much more elastic to loan rates as depositors are to deposit rates. So it would be better for banks to adjust by little, you know, that the, the loan rate reduce it to keep the depositors in because they value this complementarity. And it's also not obvious that loan rates would go up and down in response to BDC, right? Because they could be reduced to attract borrowers to the complementarity, but it could also be increased, right? If, if the CBDC, for example, makes deposit funding more costly as, as they show that it does. So data is there, right, from loan rates. It's used for bank profits, but it's not used to uh, determine the benefit that, that borrowers get from financial products. So I think that's, that's an easy thing that could be adjusted and, and also you could think of, of estimating a demand for bundles rather than, than this kind of sequential choice that, that they model in which houses choose deposits and loans as, as kind of a, in a simultaneous way. Uh, um, and Matt Jansko has an interesting AR paper that started this literature. I was also a little bit puzzled by the fact that there's a parameter in the model that basically determines the fraction of houses who obtain the loan, right? This is all held as fixed. And, and I wonder, you know, to what extent this is demand or supply. So a little bit of more discussion on that would, would, would help. Second point I have is, is on single bank for deposits, right? So the way these models are, are geared is to basically allow for mutually exclusive alternatives. So this means that you can only choose one bank as your deposit, but you know, we, 
I would like to understand to what extent this is true in the data. So I, I don't know if for Canada, I look for data from the Netherlands and I uh, just had evidence from a relatively old survey, which shows that 22% of households actually deposit across multiple banks. And these are the most wealthy ones, right? So in terms, if you think of volume adjusted, this is potentially a non-negligible fraction of, of money that is deposited by the same person across across different banks. And, and I, I'm also think, thinking that, you know, going ahead, if, if I think about the keynote speech, uh, you know, if we have this big tech firms that offer digital wallets, maybe multi-homing in terms of deposits is, is the trend that they we're going towards. So perhaps it, catering the model to this type of, of behavior of consumers might be an interesting extension. And, and you could think of, you know, people depositing across multiple banks, CBDC and a private bank. And this would change the interpretation that Andrew gave in terms of how this affects constrained households because of the holding limit, right? And it would be also more realistic, I think, if you're allowing the CBDC to use the service location of branch networks, right? Because then you're already going to the branch for CBDC, then you might as well open an extra deposit account there. And connected to this, if, if CBDC uses the branch network, and then I think there could be, you know, kind of, revenues that banks should expect for offering this service that could be included into the model to, to um, kind of uh, take into account of their response. I have a few comments on the identification, right? Now, the key parameter here in the model is, is basically depositors demand elasticity, because that tells you the substitution that, that happens in the data. Um, and so here, I think it would be nice to compare this, the numbers that you get to the literature. I, it's a little bit different the way you estimate demand relative to what other people have done, but I think we have a bunch of numbers out there for this class of IO models, so I think it would be useful to, to know how you compare to those. It, it wasn't also not entirely clear to me what kind of variation in the data allows you to separately identify the fact of the branch networks have on the three decisions that households are making in this model, right? Deposit, cash versus deposit, and this this uh, financial products, and especially that you know these three decisions might have correlated on observables, and, and perhaps modeling them sequentially might lose a little bit of that. Um, I was also a little bit puzzled that you know you don't use any instruments here for for uh, to 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 recover the slope of the demand curve, and which is kind of standard in the literature. And and the last point I have here is that you focus on households with our insured depositors, presumably. But there's a fraction of, of, of depositors that are uninsured, right? If I look at the Eurozone data that I've worked on, that, that's kind of 25% of total overnight deposits that are uninsured. So these are firms potentially, and what the literature shows is that uh, uh, uninsured depositors, or large depositors, are less sensitive to deposit rates and are likely benefiting more from complementarity relative to households because they're more likely to get a financial product. And so this might mitigate the impact that you're finding even further. So I, I, I wonder whether, you know, you could have at least some aggregate data on, on uninsured deposits that you could, that you could include. Um, and then the last point I have is, is kind of on a bigger picture view of how this model could be used or taking, taking ahead and, and, and extend it to understand the, um, yeah, uh, uh, how CBDC affects the banking sector through the lens of an IO model. So for stability, there's this night paper by, by Egan or Taxo and Mavos that actually endogenize banks default and, and, and uh, still have the positive competition. And it's not obvious, you know, from, from, from your model how CBDC would affect stability. It could be a negative effect if deposits become more costly, but it could be positive, right? If, for example, banks balance sheets shrink and they become less systemic, of course, there's consequences for the real economy. But, but at the same time, it could also be that, you know, if CBDC deposits are lent to banks via lending facilities, this is something that the model could, could uh, quantify, right? This could have a positive effect on, on stability. I was also interested by the effect on concentration that you show, right? In one of your counterfactuals, you show that larger banks, those with a larger markup, are the ones that suffer the, la the least from the introduction of CBDC. So this could have some consequences for competition policy as well. And, and if we think about concentration, this is also something that mediates the transmission of monetary policy. And that's something that you could look at in, in your paper, right? Because if the banking sector becomes concentrated, this, you know, through the, a, a market power effect could affect negatively the transmission. But, you know, if, if the central bank uses CBDC to directly implement monetary policy, this could, you know, ease the transmission. And, and there's a nice paper on that that you could rely on. So let me just conclude to say that I really like this paper. I very much enjoyed reading it. I think it's it's you know it's a good take and and it's a use of IO models, which is slightly different from most of the papers that we've seen 
uh, today and yesterday. I think highlighting the importance of product differentiation, you know, service location and complementary financial products is something that tells us about the, you know, kind of the pass through and the effects of, of, of CBDC on deposit markets. Uh, what I would work on in, is, you know, focusing a little bit more on perhaps making the loan rates endogenous in the model. I think that's not too hard. And perhaps also including this other class of depositors, the uninsured ones that, um, you know, could also be run prone, for example, so it might have a, some effects on, on stability too. And then I would, you know, overall think of, you know, how this model could be extended for other papers to look at stability, concentration, and transpatient monetary policy. So thank you again for asking me to discuss this. And, and... Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, before giving uh, the uh, giving Andrew a chance to respond, let's collect a few questions from the audience and perhaps online as well. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, I, I fully agree with you that I think um, the service location and the network is very important. However, I think this was very focused on the physical world. And I think, I mean, we're talking about the future of money. So I don't really care how close the next post office to me is or how close the next bank branch it is, but I much more care about the user experience and kind of the digital convenience and how easy it's to onboard kind of by video identification. So I was wondering kind of how, how kind of what would this change if you also look at this digital kind of the, the digit i mean the digital digital convenience of it and and what it would change and how it could be onboarded and i don't know also how i mean i guess it's much more difficult to find data on this so how we can bring this into the model and what would it change thanks thank you it was a fantastic paper first of all and I have two points. One is more about the discussion. I, I totally agree that the issue of multiple accounts in different banking is crucial. And one thing that there is a literature mostly on, I know a couple of paper on, on Denmark, where they show that regulation on uh, insurance of deposits is crucial in order to see this kind of behavior. So when you have a limit in a single bank, you can have regulation where you are, are allowed to have let's say more than account and it, it and the limit is is uh, is not binding in this way the second point is is on the um, on bank side so on the supply side of deposits as i know about europe i don't know very well about the 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 situation in canada when you did your estimate but here is in order to look for the degree of competition on deposits, it really depends on, on the unconventional policies that we had during the last 20 years. So we know that the, the, the QE had increased a lot the amount of deposit, reducing the, the, the competition. So I don't know how robust your results are on this. Thanks. So my question is about your results on holding limits. Um, so for one, I'm not so sure about how you actually identify um, the effect from the data. And then I also wonder um, about which type of holdings, holding limits we're actually talking about. So is it the type of holding limits that prevent you from using it, or the CBDC in payments? Or is it rather the type that um, yeah, just appears bad? You as a customer see it's uh, 300 euros and it looks bad. And you don't want to hold that. So I ask it because at least talking for the digital euro, there are solutions um, that would allow you to still make a payment even though you breach the holding limit. Uh, a great paper, I think. Um, so uh, I kind of agree with what was asked before. Uh, the onboarding would be made by commercial banks. I mean, it's not that we are going to go to some physical place and demonstrate who we are to be open. No, I mean, wallets would be offered by banks in a tier system. KYC is already done. That's the quid pro quo between central bank and commercial banks, right? So uh, you commercial banks, you do kind of the dirty job for me of offering CBDCs. The question is what they're going to get in return. 
two things first in fact it was asked by nicola remuneration of course is going to be a fee most likely the question is how to calibrate the fee second is the um offering as panetta said yesterday that cbdc's will be depotentiated from what they could do offering zero remuneration um and uh, not programmable so this opens the space for commercial banks to offer something new even compared to the standard deposits that you're talking about and is absolutely correct that what uh, make you choose one bank versus the others is the financial products attached so this new thing could be either a tokenized deposit or a stable coin issued by commercial banks with service attached to it and then the competition will be among commercial banks and CBDCs will only be the basis of a payment system to ensure that there's trust in the digital asset world the way they want to do it. Then they can be turbocharged one, you know, 10 years from down, down the line, but not now. So how your model would change if this new form of bank um, instruments such as tokenized deposit or stable coin were to be introduced? Thank you. Um, so perhaps one thing uh, concerning the the uptake that you get that this very small amount if you have only the um, up to the the onboarding not going through banks or post offices um, so how would you define uh, CBDC to be successful because basically you don't have I think payment use for payments in your model so would you also consider CBDC to be successful if you have a very small percentage holding overall but lots of uh, of of, of uh, transactions going through or would you require uh, sufficient amounts of holding to qualify it as a success Thank you. okay andrew if you could maybe limit it to two three minutes uh, at most or a few minutes okay. in in response so we enjoy enjoy the coffee a after here. Sorry? You're giving me a lifeline then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for the discussion and the questions. I think I'll work in reverse order, uh, since that's what I have open. Uh, on this last point about defining a success far above my pay grade, uh, I think you have reached a really interesting question, though, about differentiating between holding limit and usage in payments. Uh, I also want to encourage you to think about maybe it's an outside option, that it could be a success if both are zero. It could be a case that you're changing the uh, attributes that are offered in the private sector, and we could be having a massive important effect even if we observe zeros. So I, 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 I've struggled to try and uh, answer that when my boss asked what would be a success. Uh, I struggle again to know what a success would be. We can tell you what the, what the positive answer is. The normative answer is much, much trickier. Uh, the onboarding, so I think there's two people that asked that. Why are we using a physical location? Uh, my answer is going to be in the survey data, the households care a great deal. Uh, we still have 80, something like 65% of households going in every month to their, their branch location. I think most of the people I talk to, people in this room probably don't go to their branches that much. A lot of people do. Uh, I think one of the ways we could think about moving towards the future is we have age and i think we've done some work to look at the younger people are less sensitive to branch location but they're still sensitive and that sensitivity is very high so so it it's it's onboarding or it's service they can get or it's even awareness and and uh, understanding of where they could get service if they needed it so it could be the option value of service uh in terms of purely online we have purely online banks in Canada, they have a very low market share. So our model is gonna say people don't like that very much. Uh, holding limits, which type of holding limit? Uh, the one that can work in our model, which is very stark, which is if you go over, you just have to hold that in cash. And I think that does speak to the, the multi-homing question that I'm getting from several people. Uh, I think we're working on multi-homing. Uh, it introduces a, a couple more parameters. Uh, that the model is sensitive to. Uh, we think that uh, the single homing assumption is going to uh, sort of be the starkest result in terms of the holding limits. 
that uh, if you introduce multi-homing, people are going to hold even less in CBDC. They're going to basically balance between CBDC and, and the bank account. Uh, there's also econometric issues. How do you learn who's going to be, or how do you how do you differentiate those people that are going to be multi-homing versus single-homing? Uh, in response to to the discussion on that, yeah, it's not zero in Canada. It's probably similar to the Netherlands. Uh, question about how to model it. Uh, there was a question about the supply side, unconventional monetary policy, and QE of households. Uh, we have household data. We didn't do quite as much QE in Canada, and we certainly never had negative interest rates. So it's probably a little bit different. I also think you're probably talking about the wholesale and the larger deposits. We're looking at households. So the, the 99th percentile is a million dollars. So I think we're talking about different groups. It's probably a problem if we want to think about the European context. Maybe less so for the Canadian context, but it's a fair point. Uh, yeah, so great comments. Concentration goes up. I think this is a problem when people confuse concentration and competition. I usually think in terms of markups. When you think of a concentration, you could have a negative impact. Transmission of monetary policy, stability are great questions. It's how to add them, how to make it uh, tractable, but also uh, applicable. Uh, identification. So we're relying a little bit on we have microdata and fixed effects. I think we're, you're right. We got to ex explain that more at least. And we're going to do some sensitivity analysis around using the uh, Egan Hortaxu uh, instrument. Uh, uninsured versus insured, uh, something to look at as well. Multi-homing we're working on. Again, there's, there's into implementation questions that, that we should discuss. Uh, and then the endogeneity of, of lending. Uh, the challenge I think we're facing is how much do we want to make uh, deposits numerically equal to loans? Do we want to allow different sources of funding? That gets very quickly into the questions of, of Tony Whitehead at all. So we're, uh, we're opening an, another can of worms with that, shall I say. But thank you for the comments. They're, they're very helpful and I want to discuss them more. Awesome. Before I let you go, Andrew, yep. uh, there's one more question uh, from the online audience. The online audience. So I'm, I'm just reading it out loud. Um, uh, Elena Febrel from the Spanish Treasury asks uh, whether you've contemplated to explicitly integrate money demand functions in your model, uh, Zetrowski shopping time models, something along those lines. I know. So I think I think you're talking about micro foundations of money demand. I think we're estimating a money demand function in a sense. Uh, we haven't. It is a good point. We could probably get some variation there in terms of distances, uh, maybe for the shifting the, the consumer's uh, demand. Uh, we're allowing there to be a household specific demand for cash relative to deposits. But there's probably some things we could add in the spirit of those models, but we probably won't explicitly have one of those models. But thank you for the comment. That's that's something to think about.